This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Thank God it's a Friday. Let me begin by saying that uh, it's a Friday morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are always, always coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. Uh, and uh, with me are Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi. Good morning. <laughs> hi, good morning, Prashant. Good morning, morning, Nigel. And what a game, right, overnight. I mean, I don't think anyone, anyone expected this kind of a turnout in the India-Sri Lanka match. And first uh, team to get into the semis now. I'll tell you, you know, when the team was announced and getting into this tournament, people were doubting the boys. <laughs> Just take a look at these boys. You, the boy you doubt, he's going to play on top uh, or, you know, be on top form. Shami. I mean, what a what a spell that was yesterday, and the bowlers are winning the games as yeah. well. So Siraj and Shami, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely <laughs> pumped up yesterday, but need to be pumped up today as well because we got one trading session, and then into the weekend. I think Sri Lanka read that three fifty-seven scorers thirty-five, <laughs> <laughs> something. I mean, it was it was just a complete uh, yeah. decimation yeah, uh, in actually, that sense. And and we did to them what they have done to others in the past, right? Yeah. Because normally they have bowled out, you know, whether yeah. it's Canada or Zimbabwe for that thirty forty runs. We yeah. knocked them out in fifty. <laughs> well, good. Absolutely. Well, uh, that's an optimistic note to begin the day with. So yeah. let's just quickly take a look at uh, how things are set up as we begin uh, another session this morning. Uh, so, it's looking clearer. I mean, the fog is kind of uh, moving away and uh, the path is seeming to be a little more clearer. I mean, when I say the fog, I'm talking about the global fog especially. So, you know, US markets saw a very strong follow-through uh, post the uh, rally uh, after FOMC. I'm talking about the second day. You know, the day two, day three after the FOMC and uh, is, sometimes can be very different. But we said this yesterday in the morning, yesterday during closing as well that what happened uh, during this FOMC was significant uh, because, you know, the Fed Chair Powell seemed very comfortable with the idea of just doing nothing. He says, well, we've done a lot. And, uh, you know, even if perhaps inflation surprises to the upside, he's OK waiting it out. And that's why, uh, you know, more and more uh, commentary is now veering towards the fact that, well, you know, not just this year, uh, but maybe they're just done now in terms of interest rate hikes. But never say never. But that's the situation right now. The last night, you had so the, a very strong follow-through. So the Nasdaq was up 1.8%. The S&P was up about 1.9%. So these are uh, strong gains. I think for the S&P, this is the strongest single-day gain in the last couple of months, actually, more than a couple of months. U.S. bond deals uh, continue to see a massive cool-off. So the 10-year lost another uh, eight basis points. We're at about 4.66. Actually, in the last, from the pre-FOMC high, from the you know, that day, uh, pre-FOMC, we were at 4.9293 or so. So we've lost some 25 basis points on the U.S. 10-year. That is very, very significant. Dollar index, consequently, is also cooled off, which is the other positive thing, which is now at and closer to 105, basically. We lost almost 0.65%. Uh, oil prices have perked up a little bit, but, I mean, oil has also come off about $7, $8 very quickly. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is this geopolitical uh, risk which is, uh, which is real, it is there, and we don't know how that's going to play out. So there is a bit of a, that premium built into prices right now. They went up $3, but we're in a better place as compared to uh, over the last uh, couple of days, last few sessions or so. Uh, so I'll just put out a question once again, which I put out yesterday morning after the FOMC. Is the, is the <clears throat> sort of move till the end of the year looking a little clearer, looking a little more constructive? And I'll tell you, I'll cite three reasons for it. One is, uh, you know, if this, if we've got to believe what uh, Powell has said in the FOMC, maybe there is more st more stability, relatively more stability in U.S. rates, the bond market in the U.S. One, positioning is low, earnings have not been all that bad in the U.S. And you know, uh, consider the fact that year end is seasonally a strong time for markets. We put this data out earlier, so you add these three and. Is it just possible that we get a bit of a clearer kind of visibility all the way into the end of the year? Okay, let's just come back to the market uh, here. Uh, by the way, before that, uh, later today we'll get the NFP number, jobs data. I mean, let's just let's just hope that that's not a big blowout number. It's not expected to be. There was the auto strike, etc. But we will get the monthly U.S. jobs data, which will be closely watched. Okay, let's come to the market here. Nifty remains in a bounce mode. I mean, uh, we would have liked more. The market started strong, but could not build on it in any significant way. We basically ended slightly above where we started yesterday. Uh, so, but that's a bounce mode. Uh, 19,234 is the recent high that we got, and that remains the first level. Uh, you know, you look at the derivatives positions in F uh, what FII is doing, and this is important. As of yesterday's close, 
FIS have got the second highest net short position in index futures now. I mean, you know, they did not cut index future shorts. They actually added on to it. And as, as a result, consequently, this is the second highest net short position that FIS have in index futures. Now, that is historically proved to be uh, a good thing because, I mean, the markets uh, bounce uh, from those kind of levels and uh, the bounces sometimes can be very large, right? Uh, all the no two market phases are exactly the same, but if you just see what has happened from these kind of net short levels, the market does give you a very decent bounce. But we got to take it step by step, right? The 20 day, for example, uh, after we take out the immediate high, which is 19,230 or so, the 20 day comes in, which is 19,440. That's the second level. The immediate support it comes in at, a, at the 40 hourly exponential moving average. Yesterday, we traded above that level. All of the session, 19,117 is that level. Okay, let's just uh, look at the Nifty Bank now, which is the weaker of the two indices, very clearly. The resistance there comes in at uh, these two levels, 43,348, and then at 43,640, which is nothing but the 50% and the 61.8% retracement of the fall that we've seen in October. Uh, the, uh, you know, th th there's a 20-day also, which almost exactly coincides with that second level, which is the 61.8 at 43,640, almost exactly. Uh, the next resistance for the, uh, the uh, okay, that's a 20-day. The immediate support for the Nifty Bank is the, uh, is the 42,590 level, uh, which uh, I think hopefully will get defended and we won't have, we won't have to uh, bother about that. The small cap index has been the strongest of the lot. Uh, clearly, it fell about 7%, but, you know, as of yesterday's close, we're already past the 61.8% retracement of the fall, of the full fall from the all-time high uh, that we saw there. So, I would say, looking at the GIF Nifty, it'll come up on your screen. This is a constructive kind of a session uh, that you are uh, you're looking at, not just today, but actually I'd venture out and say over the next... A uh, couple of weeks as well, 120 odd points higher on the gift nifty. Tony. Oh, absolutely. And you know, if you remember when uh, the market hit that low of 18,850 on the 26th yeah. of October, we had made this point that every time there is a geopolitical issue, it's always uh, prudent to buy that dip because it has worked in the past. Um, history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So that's what's happened. If you look at the Nifty, right? I mean, the Nifty is now up almost 300 points from the October 26th low. So the buy on dip strategy has worked. And the US markets as well, it's been four days running now. The US markets have ended in the green. So very strong global queues there. Large domestic buying is what we saw yesterday. DI has bought almost 1400 crores in the cash markets yesterday. So that was a good thing. And you've had a lot of good quality earnings come in, uh, you know, across the board. Overnight, of course, very strong earnings from Tata Motors. The company has raised their FY24 EBIT guidance for JLR as well. We had some good numbers from m, &M Finance. The dispersal growth was strong at a seven-month high. Outside the secondary market, in the primary market, the Mama Earth IPO did quite well. The IPO was subscribed almost 7.6 times. And there are lots of earnings coming through today. There's Titan, Escorts, Kubota, Interclove, Aviation, etc. So the mood is good. The fundamentals are positive. The market has seen a rebound. And today looks like it's going to be a pretty strong day. Of course, it is the end of the week. And you do have a lot of, uh, you know, global cues. But I think that the bulls have sort of started to once again tighten their grip on the market. Well, that's right. So now you buy the dip and there's a war that's played out, right? But we're still below those levels, you know, because yes. on the day that this broke up, we were at 19,450. And today, we're at around 19,150. So yeah. buying that dip for the longer term will definitely work. And as things stand now, things are clearing out. So hopefully, uh, you know, the conflict in Israel as well does subside. And we move higher. For the time being, the street is taking uh, heart from the fact that the Fed, maybe they sounded more dovish and they're not expecting any kind of rate hikes. So in yesterday's trading session as well, the Nifty, well, we saw the intraday dip, but it ended at around the 19,130, as we mentioned yesterday. Well, it hit that 19,170, and that was the resistance and the high of the day as well. Global queues are good. The Nifty Bank, that's going to be the crucial one today. It's nearing the 200 DMA. Over the weekend, you have SBI results. So the Nifty Bank's going to be very, very important. And one more data point out there. For the last six weeks, the Nifty Bank has ended in the negative terrain. Now, if we can hold above that 42,782, which we're currently trading above, it'll be the first winning week for the Nifty Bank after six uh, trading weeks that it has ended lower. What did the FIs do? Well, they added 20,000 short contracts. That was in the ratio of three shots for every one long position. And in percentage terms, it's at around 84% odd. Just pull up the chart out there. You know, we started off uh, the contract uh, last week, the new contract, that is. And from there, the FIH net short positions have just moved up from around 1.5 lakh to around 1.76 lakh odd. 
Earlier this year, we have seen 1.8 lakh contracts, 1.85 lakh contracts, 1.95 lakh contracts as well. So we're at the upper end in terms of the net short contracts and at around 1.76 uh, lakh contracts. If they're not going to get follow through, that's what could cause them to cover out. So I always say a net short market is not such a bad thing from a bullish perspective. Two strikes should come up for you. 19,100 put added closure on 30 lakh shares out there. The premium out there went from around 100 rupees to around 71 rupees and there were signs of writing out there. So for the next few sessions, the bulls, they are setting up that that 19,000 odd mark holds out. But on the upside, the 19,200 call as well, the premium out there moved from around 85 to around 100 rupees. And out there, we had closure on 20 lakh shares that were added. On the call side, the highest op amount of open interest is at this 19,200 call on. So you just plug in the numbers. We're going to be starting closer to the recent high, which is 19,233. So you'll want to get past that first up. Then you run into resistance, 19,250 to 19,300. That's the zone where we've seen the best come into fight. So you want the Nifty to move into that level and ultimately conquer that. Support, as I said earlier, is at around 19,000. And if the Nifty needs to conquer this 19,250 mark, the Nifty Bank needs to play a role. It's only around 200 points approximately away from the 200 DMA. You wanted to get past that and then make a chart show around the 20 DMA. So for today, the Nifty Bank is going to be the crucial one. It's going to be, in all probability, crossing that, uh, you know, that initial resistance zone of around 42,200 at the start, it needs to build on from there. Gift Nifty suggesting a 100-point gap up. So let's hope for a good Friday. Okay, let's hope for a good Friday. And a lot of big numbers coming through later through the course of the day. But that's Titan, there's Indigo and a whole host of others in the broader markets as well. So let's kickstart the show with some opinion coming through. On the equities front, Surendra Goyal of City says, halfway through, the earnings have been resilient and ahead of expectations. X of energy, EBITDA growth has been at 18% while profit growth at 24%. Sectors with better than expected earnings include auto, cement and oil marketing companies, while IT has seen downgrades. City adds Reliance and iShare, replaces SBI with HDFC Bank and removes IGL and Ashok Leyland from their preferred list. They continue to prefer uh, large caps over mid caps and they see the Nifty hitting 21,000 by June 2024. Okay, let's get you some uh, <clears throat> money market views as well. We Lakshman and the Federal Bank says that the Fed has held rates is widely expected, which many see as a potential peak. Meanwhile, Bank of England has also held rates at 15-year highs. US Treasury yields cooling off from a multi-year high and dollar index retreating to near 106 levels provides some respite to rupee, which is struggling near all-time lows. He expects the rupee to trade between uh, around the 83 levels in the coming week. Okay, and on the bonds, uh, V. Lakshmanan says the bond market is cautious on possible OMO sales in coming sessions. Global yield cooling off will give some breathing room for domestic bonds. He expects the Indian 10-year benchmark to trade in a 7.28 to 7.36% zone in the coming sessions. Well, we have a lot of stock specific action track for you. We get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 <coughs> segment. Let's run you through the list first up. Tata Motors, Gujarat Gas, Spark, Concord, JK Lakshmi Cement, Ratna Money Metals, we have IEX as well as Mahindra and Mahindra Financial. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow. While on the flip side, you have Sheila Form and Relica Enterprises that will be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, Dean Kim is with us now to take some questions on how he's looking at things. He's head of global research uh, product at William O'Neill. Uh, Dean, good to have you with us here. There is strength in US. Will that mean strength for other markets, for markets like India? Your sense? Um, yeah, I mean, we had a uh, we raised the market status to uptrend following a powerful rally in both S and P and Nasdaq today in the U S. Uh, both indices cleared resistance at the 200-day moving average, and the next level of resistance is at the 50. Uh, so very welcoming, um, you know, action today, and uh, and coincidentally, a lot of the stocks, particularly the mega cap stocks and tech stocks, uh, some of them they're reporting really well. Uh, so that's good to see. Uh, the breadth of the market uh, was heavily damaged with only 18% of New York Stock Exchange stocks trading above their 150-day moving averages two, two weeks ago. Uh, but we're now starting to make some improvements today uh, with 21% uh, now above it. Uh, so things are looking good uh, for now. Uh, I think uh, the trajectory of uh, Fed rates, uh, they're probably going to be on hold. Um, there is the possibility of one more rate hike in December, uh, but given the fact that uh, you know the bond yields have uh, been, you know, testing five percent uh, just recently, um, it's doing its job. And um, when you, when we look at mortgages in the U.S., it's eight uh, percent. So financial conditions are very tight, 
And, um, and I think that um, if they were to stay course and not raise rates, uh, that would be, um, you know, understandable. Mm. Uh, Dean, hi, good morning and thanks for joining in. On the Nifty, what is your uh, chart looking like now? I mean, we've seen a recovery of almost 300 points from the lows that we hit in October. Uh, is there still more to go on the upside? And if yes, what would the targets look like by the end of the year? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, the Indian market has a little bit of work to do. Um, you know, we saw a bounce off the 200-day moving average. And uh, now the resistance is uh, at around the 10-day moving average followed by 21-day. Um, and so, you know, the way, the way I see things is um, uh, basically China is still uh, in uh, downtrend. So there should be continued interest in India. Um, I think the pull, pull down from India in terms of index was uh, caused by uh, the weak U.S. market. And uh, now that the U.S. is recovering, uh, there should be some interest in, um, you know, uh, emerging markets, uh, particularly India. Uh, so I am looking for uh, India to sort of reclaim the short-term moving averages and uh, make its way back up again. All right. Hi, Dean. Uh, good morning. Uh, you know, the last time you, jo you joined in, you were telling us about a few stocks, EIH, Sarah, I think. Um, you'd also spoken about Varun Beverages. So from the Indian market, uh, what are you looking at? Are you looking at more the large caps? Last time around, you mentioned quite a few of these mid-cap names that are very well-run companies. Your view? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, in my screening, uh, I'm noticing a lot, uh, a lot of uh, sort of mid-cap names uh, continuing to pop up, uh, particularly in the financial sector. So, for example, like consumer finance companies, um, you know, whether it be... Uh, um, credit access, uh, even Indocent Bank, uh, that's setting up, that's a large cap, like l and Finance uh, and Equitas Small Finance, Central Depository Services. Um, these are sort of the smaller cap, uh, mid-cap names in financial sector uh, that appears to be doing really well. Um, the larger cap uh, financial names, particularly private banks, they still have a ways to go. Um, but uh, I would continue to focus on uh, perhaps uh, state banks um, like Punjab National Bank, uh, that one looks really good. And um, like I said, Indocent Bank, uh, that's setting up right now. Okay, all right. So those are a, a couple of banks. What about uh, some of the IT names? How are you looking at them? Post numbers, it's been a sort of a mixed bag, but a lot of the IT companies have come back from their lows. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, um, actually, the, the smaller cap, mid cap uh, tech names look uh, pretty good at the moment. Um, Dixon Technologies continue to look pretty good. Uh, Persistent Systems, uh, Sonata Software, I would focus on those names um, as they're sort of breaking out from uh, early stage base. Um, yeah, they, they look particularly good. Unfortunately, you know, Tata uh, and uh, uh, Tata Consultancy, as well as Infosys, uh, still have a ways to go. Um, they won't really, you know, uh, outperform until uh, U.S. sort of stabilizes and, and get their footing. Okay. Uh, Dean, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're expecting a, a bit of a trending market, at least in the U.S., and good to get your views here in India as well. We'll take a quick commercial break here. A list of top stocks to watch for the day coming up next with the research team. Stay with us.
welcome back. It looks like it's going to be a pretty good day of trade. You know, the Nifty, the Gift Nifty is suggesting a 100-point opening. And we have a lot of positive cues. So, let's get straight to it. One of the big positive cues this morning is Starter Motors numbers. Strong numbers coming through and I'm expecting the stock to be in the green. It was the Jaguar Land Rover business that has done very well this time. So, the EBITDA margins have gone up 430 basis points year on year. Uh, and the EBIT margins, the EBIT margins have come in at 7.3% compared to 1% last year. The company has also gone ahead and raised their EBIT margin guidance for the full year to 8% from 6% earlier. That's the kind of confidence that they have in the business. Also, their balance sheet is improving. They continue to expect free cash flows of over £2 billion. And the net debt is expected to reduce to less than £1 billion by the end of FY24. Brokerages are very upbeat. In any case, a lot of brokerages had raised their target prices earlier. Morgan Stanley says it's an impressive quarter. CLSA says the business momentum is very strong. Jeffrey says it's a good quarter too and a strong uh, second half outlook. So I'm going with green on Tata Motors this morning. Okay, all right. Green on Tata Motors. But let's focus on Gujarat Gas. Sonal joins us to tell us how did she read those numbers. Morning, Sonal. Good morning, Nigel. Well, it was a good margin performance and a margin-led beat for Gujarat Gas this time. So margins, they are up to 70 basis points on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, much better than what the street was working with. Overall, revenues are up 2%. EBITDA is up 33% to come at 490. 7 crore rupees. Margins, they are higher by 270 basis points at 12.9%. Uh, there was an expectation of around 10.1% margins. Profits are up 47% to come in at around 300 crore rupees. Volumes, however, they are a slight miss, but nothing to worry about. They came in at 9.32 MMS CMD versus a Motilal Oswal uh, estimate of around 9.7 MMS CMD. But EBITDA per SCM, a big beat there at 5.8 rupees per SCM. Uh, so because of the margin-led beat, expecting a green on the stock today. All right, uh, Sonal, thanks very much for that. Uh, spark is the next one we're focusing on. It had a bit of a spark over the last couple of days uh, as well on the back of the news flow. But uh, Ikta, tell us more. Thanks for that. <clears throat> well, they updated their investors with regards to their R&D pipeline. So they've said that the year 2024 promises several inflection points when it comes to key drugs in their pipeline for cancer as well as psoriasis. They expect additional non-dilutive cash flows from commercial and partnered assets which they already have and generating income from as well. In terms of cash flow, they've outlicensed a seizure drug in Q4 and they've received an upfront payment of $10 million. They expect a milestones in royalties going forward. They've received 703 crores in Jan 2023 against a conversion of warrants. Cash of around 363 crores on its book. A line of credit from the parent is around 250 crores, which is in place. And they have shareholder approval to raise around 1800 crores by way of fresh issuances. So maybe we could see some amount of follow on buying based on the fact that they are very positive in terms of milestones on in 2024 for their R&D portfolio. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Ekta. Well, Mangalam is with us. He has Concor and Sheila Foam on his radar. Mangalam, over to you. Good morning. So I'm looking at Container Corp because of the Q2 numbers. Uh, the re realizations in their export business led to their revenues to grow about 10.5% year on year. We also saw, uh, you know, the margins uh, at around 25%. This compares with 25.5%. That decline is largely, uh, you know, operational in nature. The net profit jumped 21% because it was aided by higher other income, which came in at 105 crores versus 43 odd crores itself. The reason why I say realizations are improving, because Exim revenues grew 9.5%, whereas the volume growth which the company has revealed already was just around 3.5%. Though there was some reduction in realization in the domestic business, maybe because of the festive season moving into the third quarter. Uh, the land license fee, the quarterly LLF rate also came down to around 85 odd crores versus the previous quarter of 130 crores. So that's a mild positive, also given the underperformance that we've seen in the stock over the last one month or so. Sheila Foam as well was uh, uh, impacted by the shifted, uh, festive season shift and the wedding season shift into the third quarter, where the revenues declined by 10%, the EBITDA declined by 15%, and the net profit declined by 17% as well. For starters, we expect Sheila Foam to be in the red, but will be important to see what it happens, uh, what happens in the second half of trade, largely because the big trigger of the curl on acquisition playout is still underway. Okay, Manglam, uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, Vivek joins in to tell us about IEX numbers. Vivek? Well, uh, good morning. That's right. So, you know, in the context of rising power demand, you know, the short-term power exchanges are seeing significant volume growth and IEX2 has been a beneficiary of that. Uh, it's been a steady quarter, strong operational performance from the company this time around. Revenues higher by 14% on a year-on-year -year basis, coming in at the 109 crore mark. Uh, EBITDA is up 16.5% and margins to 
have expanded by 180 basis points. Profitability on the back of that is up 21.5%. Overall volume growth for the company in Q2 was over 14%, coming in at 26.1 billion units. Going forward, the company has given encouraging commentary. They are saying that they are continuing to see increasing sell-side liquidity, increasing demand as far as the exchanges are concerned. And there are more sellers right now on the exchanges on the back of the fact that gas prices have cooled off quite significantly. Along with that, the average price of power on the exchange too has gone up. It is now rupees 5.88 per kilowatt hour as far as each unit is concerned. And this is up sequentially from Q2 as well. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Vivek. Well, I'm looking at two stocks and expect both of them to open up in the green. One is JK Lakshmi Cement. I'm looking at the standalone numbers because Udaipur Cement already came out with the set of numbers, which is a smaller part of their business. So in the standalone business, you have a revenue growth of close to 11.5%. Most of that is because of sales volumes, because that was up by closure around 10% approximately. The EBITDA number, though, jumped up by closure on 30%, telling you that margins have done quite well. So after a weakish quarter, you know, the past quarter, this quarter, it's a bounce back. You have margins that expand by closure on 150 basis points or thereabouts, which is pretty good news. Uh, the profit number as well, uh, you know, that was up by closure on 40%. And the cash flow from operations, well, that's moved up. They delivered closure on 270 crores odd that compares with an outflow. So that's encouraging because they've managed their working capital quite well. So JK Lakshmi Cement opens up well in the green. It has valuation support as well. Trades at around $90 per ton. Next up, Ratnamani Metals. Very, very good numbers. It seems a good product mix has played out for them. On the top line, you have a 26% growth. But on the EBITDA front, you have more than a 60% growth. And margins have come in at around 21.6%. The last time I saw these sort of margins or anywhere close to this was 20, 23% is what they delivered in March 2021 quarter. So after closure on 9, 10 quarters, we're seeing this sort of a performance. Very, very good set of numbers coming in from there. And in all probability, what would have happened is they have sold a high amount of stainless steel tubes. And also from the carbon steel, well, they would have sold a better uh, you know, product mix out there. So that explains why things are looking up. Profit number up close to around 66%. Finance cost has moved up on a very, very small base. But these numbers look good. Also, the cash from operations has moved up to around 350 crores from 200 crores. So good set of numbers. Stock trades at around 30 times its forward earnings are expected to open up well in the green. But Abhishek joins us because he's tracking Mahindra and Mahindra Financial Services. Morning, Abhishek. Uh, morning, Nigel. So there is a business update coming in for the month of October and it looks like a festive month has been uh, good for them. So in the month of October, the disbursals were at 5,250 crore, a similar level in last year, um, um, you know, October as well, and about 16.7% growth that you are seeing on a month-on-month -on -month basis. So this is a seven-month high in terms of uh, monthly disbursals for them. A collection efficiency has dipped to 94% in the month of October versus 97% that they had in September, but this is seasonal in nature. Even in last year, October 2022, uh, the uh, collection efficiency had dipped to 91% versus 98% in the month of September 2022. So it's a seasonal in nature. Year to date, the disbursals are at 30,725 crore, up about 16.3% YOY. The asset book has grown by 2.3% month on month. Stage 2 and stage 3, which is loan overdue between 60 to 90 days and above 90 days, they have remained range bound to the Q to FI24 numbers. Liquidity chest in the balance sheet is over two and a half months, which is uh, similar to the levels that we saw in September as well. Back to you. All right. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that. That's another stock which has taken a battering after the last quarter numbers. Uh, Vishik, uh, thank you. Relegator really is the next one we're focusing on. Uh, Upasana has got details on the numbers here. Upasana. Well, Rally Air Enterprises have reported its Q2 FI24 numbers and from the face of it, numbers look sequentially weak right now. The revenue stood at 1,585 crores with an uptick of 23% sequentially and revenue growth was mainly led by broking and insurance segment. While broking saw an uptick of almost 25% and insurance saw an uptick of almost 24% sequentially and investment and financing activity saw a downtick of almost 26% sequentially. While talking about the other income, it's saw a downtick of almost 93% on quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis and total expenses is where we see an uptick of almost 28% sequentially. PAT has seen a downtick of almost 56% and it stood at somewhere around 40 crores. So higher expenses and fallen other income have dragged the PAT growth sequentially. So we'll be waiting for more details for further understanding of numbers. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Here's a quick recap of our top stocks, stocks with positive news flow. The Stata Motors, Gujarat Gas, Spark, Concord, JK Lakshmi Cement, Ratnamani Metals and Tubes, uh, IEX and m, &M Financial, while stocks with negative news flow, Sheila Foam and Relegate Enterprises. 
But let's also get a quick handle on what's happening in the world of commodities. Manisha Gupta is joining in for a roundup of all the action there. Manisha, good morning. Morning and thank you for that, uh, Sonia. Well, we are looking at the decline in U.S. dollar index, which seems to be the supporting factor across commodities. Uh, but having said that, even with that, this is a week that seems to be ending in the negative for many of these commodities. Crude, for example, is headed for a second weekly decline. It's down 4% this week. Prices did see a decline of 3% in the previous week as well. It has to do with the weak Chinese data and the war premium now coming off into the market as no other countries in the Middle East are joining the conflict and there is no disruption in the crude oil supplies. Also, markets are looking at not so strong signals from the U.S. Fed or even Bank of Japan and Bank of England, and that has weight onto the markets as well. We have seen a similar scenario coming for gold, which is headed for a first weekly decline in four weeks. Markets are looking at Fed fund futures saying that there's an 80 percent chance of a rate pause continuing into the month of December as well. And that would be a supportive factor. All right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Manisha, for that. We'll take a quick commercial break here. Up next, Nishal Maheshwari of Centrum Broking will be joining in uh, for some fundamental stock check. We'll also have... Uh, Pirosha Godridge of Godridge Properties uh, joining us for their second quarter performance uh, and a chat with the management coming up. Stay with us. Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Well, the equity markets are set for a positive opening, but plenty of stocks to discuss. Nishal Maishwari, CEO, Institutional Equities and Advisory at Centrum Broking, joins us on the show. Hi, Nishal. Good morning. Well, the big number that came post-market hours was 
Tata Motors and as Sonia was telling us, those numbers look quite good with an upping of guidance at JLR. What's your view on the stock from year on? I mean, the stock has already seen a big outperformance. Does it go up further from here? Uh, morning, Nigel. I think, uh, yeah, good performance from Tata Motors, actually. I think, uh, but uh, uh, what we have to actually uh, keep on looking out for is basically a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, obviously the cash flows. So they have been guiding for a strong free cash flow, basically. So I think that is one thing, basically, we have to keep on looking out for. And uh, yes, at the moment, the numbers are strong. So one can keep on accumulating at these prices. Mm. One can keep accumulating at these prices. All right, got that. Uh, you know, the other uh, uh, stock I wanted to check with you was SBI. It comes out with its earnings tomorrow. And I was going through some estimates which indicate that the earnings are expected to be quite good. The asset quality is expected to improve further. Uh, any thoughts on whether one should sort of load up on SBI before the earnings? <laughs> I think the market is pretty loaded, basically, already with the <laughs> large bank. And... <laughs> So I think that's why these banks are not performing. Actually, if you really look at it, most of them are either equal weight or fully weighted uh, or, or overweight uh, on the banking sector. And I think the large banks uh, constitute a large portion of everybody's portfolio. Now, having said that, I think, yes, I think SBI at these prices look attractive. Uh, the performance has been pretty strong for the last two, three quarters. And at least for a couple of more quarters, we don't see any issues basically happening. Yes, there will be a bit of a NIM compression, which is, I think, already factored in the market. Uh, but I think that is also bottoming out now. Basically, most of the bank results, which I've seen, I think they have been guiding that this is going to be the uh, worst case scenario as far as NIMS, or this is going to be the worst uh, uh, or bottoming out of the NIMS in the current quarter. So incrementally, uh, yes, I think uh, these prices, SBI looks attractive. Nigel, hi, morning. REC, PFC, if you have any thoughts, numbers came and they're strong, uh, the guidance, etc., looks good. And uh, after that, two other stocks, which I have little hope you have coverage on, but uh, Jay Prakash, which has doubled in the last 10 days, and IDEA, which is also uh, bouncing around. So, you, you are right, actually. Uh, morning, Prasant, uh, right. Uh, we don't have coverage on both of them, basically, neither Jay Prakash, neither IDEA. So I don't, so uh, very, very hard to make a, a take call on Jay Prakash especially because I don't know what's really happening. But at least idea we know uh, it's a distance third, continues to lose uh, 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 subscribers every quarter. The only good thing about idea is basically that the postpaid still continues to remain pretty steady for them. And what they're losing is 2G customers and low end customers. So that's why I think uh, they are still there. But I think Eventually, we have to find a solution to that 60,000 crores of debt, basically, which is there and the government outstanding. So, uh, that way, I think uh, that is uh, my view on idea. I think if government steps in and converts the debt to equity, I think then it could be a good uh, uh, pick from these levels. Uh, but I think we have to wait for that. REC, PFC, yes, uh, good set of results, but we have to see whether you should be looking from these prices or not, actually. I think the stocks have run up quite a bit. So I would be one basically to take profits from here. All right. Uh, well, uh, just stay on with us. I do want your thoughts on Godrich Properties as well. We have the management with us. It was a good quarterly performance by Godrich Properties in Q2. Bookings and collections as well as volumes also a healthy growth both sequentially and year on year. The company has also achieved 52% of FY24 revenue guidance and they say that they are on track to meet their FY24 guidance on all parameters. Uh, Sonal caught up with Pirod Shah Godrej, the executive chairman of Godrej Properties, to discuss their Q2 performance, began by asking about the project pipeline and the FY24 guidance. Listen in. We're very excited to see both uh, the external market for the residential real estate sector performing very well, demand levels across markets being quite high. We're extremely excited with uh, the numbers that we saw in the second quarter, which frankly surpassed our own expectations with growth of over 100% in bookings during the quarter. We have a pretty robust uh, launch pipeline for the second half of the financial year. Significant upcoming new launches in NCR with a few of the new Gurgaon projects we added 
last year, we hope to launch uh, our, our large project in Delhi in Ashok Vihar. Um, we have several launches planned here in Mumbai, including a new phase of our Vikroli project, um, uh, upcoming launches as well in Pune, Bangalore, and elsewhere. So overall, I think the pipeline looks uh, very full. We're hopeful uh, that we won't see uh, too many delays from a regulatory approval perspective. And if we're able to bring all of these projects to market, uh, I think it, we, we can expect to see a pretty strong year from a, from a bookings growth perspective. And hopefully, we can go well past our, our guidance number. Okay, that's interesting. And you know, the second thing that I've noticed that's been happening with Godrej Properties in the last couple of months also is that you are on a land acquisition spree as well. And this is in your geographies that you're looking at as well. Uh, just wanted to understand in terms of pricing first, uh, are land prices also increasing the way we have seen it in home prices? And uh, second, what is the plan with land acquisition? Is there a kitty set aside? Um, is, there a, uh, is there a measurement that you have in mind as well? Yeah, actually, you know, a few years ago, our sense was that when the market was in a downturn, that things were likely to turn and turn quite dramatically, and that it would hold us in good stead to do kind of disproportionate levels of business development to really strengthen our portfolio when land values we thought were at reasonable levels, and when the projects that we acquired were likely to be largely developed in a rising market. So far, I'm happy to say that that thesis is playing out uh, pretty much as we'd expected. Um, we have done quite disproportionate business development in the last few years. For example, last year, where we had about 12,000 crore, a little over 12,000 crore of booking value, our business development locked in a future booking value of about 32,000 crore, which again was intentionally disproportionate to immediate scale with this idea that it will allow us to deliver kind of more rapid growth in an improving market. Um, I think the market now in many places is already very well established, already quite heated, I would say, in places like, like NCR, and, and land prices certainly have accordingly corrected as well. Um, so business development is no longer the number one focus for the company. We feel for the next two or three years, the existing portfolio of projects we have can deliver the kind of uh, you know fairly rapid growth we want to ensure we deliver. And so the biggest priority is now bringing all of these projects we've added over the last few years to market through new launches over the coming quarters. That said, of course, that doesn't mean that business development will, will halt entirely, quite the, quite the contrary. We will certainly continue to do targeted business development in markets where we feel our portfolio needs to be further strengthened. We'll also, of course, look to ensure that we're replacing uh, what we're selling, but we're not anticipating and, and do not want another kind of year like last year where we had very disproportionate business development because we think the the market is no longer, first of all, quite as attractive as it was. And secondly, we have never been a company that's believed in land banking or just adding projects that we you know, intend to develop at a later stage. And the portfolio from an immediate development perspective is already looking very full and very capable of delivering the kind of growth we want to see. Okay, you interestingly mentioned that markets are heating up uh, when it comes to the NCR region, and that continues to be your biggest portfolio. Are you seeing some pricing wars coming in as well? Because we do have a lot of players which are looking at NCR market. You do have established players as, the, as well. They're big ones like yourself. What we've seen in our recent projects is very strong demand at prices that are you know, substantially higher than they were uh, a couple of years ago. So we're not, as of now, seeing any pressure on pricing. If anything, it's, it's continuing to move up uh, quite a bit over the past few quarters. So when you say quite a bit and prices higher than what you were expecting, can we say high double digits? Because some of the analysts estimated that they were 30 to 17% higher than what the company themselves expected. Yeah, that sounds sounds about right in in some of these individual projects. Of course, it's also not a you know market by market question. Each project, um, you know, depends on on the, the the sort of specifics of that micro market. But yes, in in some parts of the NCR, I think it is double digit kind of increases in prices that we're talking about. Okay, so while things are looking good, demand is higher. One thing that is. Uh... Uh, coming on your balance sheet, and that's the higher debt. It has increased in quarter two as well to levels of around 6,000 crore rupees. Your net gearing has come at an 11 quarter high. What are the plans here? Till what level of net gearing will you be comfortable? And uh, one of the analysts also said that you need to improve the cash flows in, in order to ensure that there's comfort. What is the plan here? No, I think, again, this is very much according to our own internal plan. Um, you know, the whole goal was to raise equity capital 
um, a few years ago, use that capital to ensure that we've strengthened the balance sheet that we've created the bandwidth to go out and you know source the kind of aggressive business development we wanted to do over the past two, three years. Fortunately, that has happened particularly last year. And as expected, as a result of that, our gearing levels have gone up. We have guided actually ever since our IPO more than 10 years ago that the, the broad comfort range we have from a gearing perspective is about one is to one. We've since revised that downwards a bit actually to 0 0.5 is to one to one is to one. Right? We used to say one is to one to 1.5 is to one. So we're still very much within that range. Um, so we don't see any, any real concern there. And operating cash flows will, we think, very significantly increase from the upcoming year onwards. You know, the way the real estate sector works is first you do the business development. Uh, you, that's obviously a capital expenditure where you see outflows. You then do the bookings, which lock in the future cash flows, but don't create much immediate cash flow in a new launch sense, because if you're doing a new launch, your bookings only get typically immediately generate five to 10% of the overall value as upfront cash flow. And then the rest of that cash is collected as the project is constructed. So there's no, in our view, great rock science here, if we're seeing the kind of business development growth and, and bookings growth um, that we have seen over the recent past, we are quite confident that uh, collections are, are going to strongly follow. And it's not that, that that's not already visible. We had over 40% growth in collections last year. We expect for the first time to cross 10,000 crore in collections in the current financial year, even in this past quarter, while not keeping pace with bookings, we did see collections grow by about 23%. Okay, that's the Godrich Properties Management uh, in conversation with my colleague Sunal uh, and uh, some outlook uh, being shared there as well. Anuj is now here with a quick look at the trade setup and how things are looking this Friday morning. Anuj, good morning. Good morning, Prashant. Uh, it's a Friday feeling, right? Uh, the market's looking good, global markets, uh, India doing well in cricket and uh, everything looking up right now. Uh, uh, the Nifty is set to open above the series high of 19.233, going by what the gift Nifty is telling us and that itself will have implications that the market trend would have once again turned on the positive side. And what's interesting is this week, the mid-cap index is up 1.1% versus Nifty, which is up 0.3%. So good chance that perhaps this mid-cap rally extends for a bit. Uh, there was massive follow-up rally in the US market. And back home, earning season is having more hits than misses. That's a good point, especially for domestic consumption-facing stocks. Uh, and in fact, you know, yesterday I was having a conversation with uh, a big market uh, uh, expert and he was telling me that Nifty's EPS is set for some upgrades after this quarter's numbers. Uh, the next big triggers for the market, of course, state elections. You will have some noise there and the RBA monetary policy next month. Uh, but the market will now start betting on perhaps pause and rate cuts uh, as well going forward and rate sensitives might do well from here on. Uh, coming to today's trade on the Nifty, the first resistance, as I said, is 19,233, which is the series high. We are likely to open above that. And the bigger resistance is 19,347, which was last week's breakdown zone. Uh, on the downside, the first support is 19,133, which is yesterday's close. And uh, the uh, uh, bigger support is 19,064, yesterday's low. On the bank Nifty, a lot depends on HDFC Bank. That's still not giving you... Uh, confidence. Uh, I mean, still missing that. Uh, let's see if that stabilizes. Uh, but the first resistance obviously is 43,200, the 200 day moving average, classical halt over there uh, over the last couple of days. And the bigger resistance is 43,356, the series high. Thanks a lot, Anuj, for that. Absolutely, it's a Friday fever for sure, right? Uh, lots of positives for the market and, uh, you know, in, in terms of cricket as well, everything going well. But Nishan Maheshwari is still with us, so let's get him on board. Uh, Nishal, I'm wondering your thoughts on M&M Finance. Very good dispersal growth. It's coming at a seven-month high. But this is a company that has sort of been very volatile, right? With its earnings, with its business, etc. For a long-term investor, how are you looking at this stock? Yes, I think the performance has uh, been a bit of a seesaw, actually. I think uh, uh, every time uh, we go aggressive and then we find out basically that uh, there are challenges as far as the... Uh, credit cost is concerned. So I think one has to be cautious here, basically, uh, uh, and it's more of a cyclical play. So one needs to be a bit cautious on m, &M Finance. Uh, I think uh, below 200, I think the stock is a good price to enter. Uh, uh, but we, uh, I'm saying the business, one has to be uh, very clear that it's a very cyclical business which they, uh, which they follow. Okay, all right. Nishal, what about Tata Steel? Uh, you know, yesterday it came out with a set of numbers the previous day. 
The stock started off low, lower because positioning was such that there was a lot of shots in the system, but it ended mildly higher in trade yesterday. Your view on it, because quarter three is going to be under pressure, Europe is going to struggle, whether you're looking at UK or even the Netherlands. From quarter four onwards, you're expecting some uptake. So you're banking on the India operations. How do you view the stock at 117? So I think both the even the fourth quarter we say we believe basically there is going to be a bit of a struggle basically because uh, the international business still is going to be under pressure. Uh, they have taken one uh, I think out of the eleven thousand crores they have taken uh, five thousand crores of write off. So what is going to happen to the next one? We need to see that basically. But uh, I think at these prices the stock seems to be uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, look uh, or factoring in all these issues. Uh, and I think the domestic business still continues to look good. We are seeing a domestic uh, uh, capex happening pretty strong. Yeah, you might be in a bit s slower. We get given that uh, general elections are around the corner, and you might uh, have some uh, uh, a month or two, uh, a quarter or two delays, basically as the uh, elections in. But I think beyond that, the stock looks at these prices. Okay, all right. Nishal, thanks a lot for joining in. Have a good weekend. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, Nitesh Thakkar, Shrikant Chauhan will be joining in for some technical trades. Stay tuned.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, there's about eight minutes to go for the pre-open session and uh, our uh, technical experts are with us to take us through what they're making of things. Mitesh and uh, Shri uh, Shrikant are uh, joining in this uh, Friday morning. Gentlemen, good morning. Good to have both of you here as always. Mitesh, uh, you know, will the global green show up in a big way here in India as well? Uh, yesterday, you know, the only uh, perhaps uh, maybe nitpicking is that we couldn't build in a big way after the opening highs. What's your sense? Uh, that you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, uh, apologies for that. I think there was some mistake. Uh, so yesterday, I think also, you know, I made this point that uh, not building up while it may feel, uh, you know, slightly sore, but not falling is a very plus point. And I think I was looking at uh, markets, you know, uh, instead of declining, getting into a choppy kind of a consolidation phase. Today, with the gap up, we are likely to open around the upper end of the range. So, 19,250, 43, 450 is what I've indicated for the Nifty and the Bank Nifty, respectively. And the challenge would be to get past these levels. If you have managed to build upon the gap up opening and see the Nifty get past 19,250, good chance that this pullback will extend to 19,400, even 550 odd levels. And similarly, for the Bank Nifty, getting past 43, 450 would see the bank if you attempt 43,800 to about 44,000 levels. So the way I approach traders, we'll try to book some profits with the gap up and see if there is strength to uh, capture these levels. In case uh, there's failure, then I think we'll exit all the long positions and then wait for the markets to head towards the lower end uh, of the range to buy again. Or in case there's a breakout, then I think we'll, adapt, we'll, we'll cover up the uh, you know uh, positions on which we book profits. All right, thanks a lot for that. Well, uh, we'll come back to you for individual stocks. But in the meantime, Shrikant Chauhan is also joining in. He's the Executive Vice President at Kotex Securities. Shrikant, hi, good morning. How are you feeling about the market? Do you think this rally can extend itself? And what are the levels to watch now? Good morning, Sonia. Good morning, Prashant. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, the market is uh, heading for the levels of 19,400, 450. The reason is because the markets were deeply oversold when it was down. Uh, from the levels of 18,850, the way the market recovered, and there is like some outperformance in Bank Nifty. Uh, based on the overall formation, we are expecting market to move towards its next important crucial resistance zone. Uh, coincidentally, it's a resistance of 100-day simple moving average, 20-day simple moving average, as well as it's a 50% retracement of the entire fall. So we are of the view that it is heading for those levels. Uh, any dip will be an opportunity to buy. Even at current levels, I think if uh, somebody is like really aggressive in the market, then one can take long positions with a stop loss at 19,100 as there is huge amount of put writing. So it's a buy at uh, current levels, more on dips. Uh, for the bank nifty, there also we are expecting 43,700, 750 sort of levels. Okay, let's talk about individual stocks then, shall we? Mitesh, what, is the, what are the stocks on your list? Sorry, uh, I have all buy calls today. Gudesh Properties is a buy with a stop at uh, 1689 for targets of 1765. NMDC is a buy with a stop at 156 for targets of around 170. Also, buy on MRF. The stock is uh, clearly showing pattern of higher highs and higher lows. So, buy here <coughs> with a stop at 109,200 for targets of 113,500. And Balrampur Shini is the final buy call. Keep a stop at 417, look for targets of 440. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Mitesh. Uh, Shrikant, what about you? Uh, good morning, Nigel. Uh, yeah, we can uh, look for adding some uh, bank stock to the positional portfolio because uh, most of them are reversing after hitting their important support levels. Uh, Access Bank is a buy at current levels with a target of close to 1,000, 20,025. We can keep stop loss somewhere close to 970. And also, we like Polycap. Uh, which is around 5050, 5060. From here, the stock can move to the levels of 5200 or 5250. We can keep stop loss somewhere close to 4975. So, Polycap and Access Bank on the watch list. All right, let's take a short break on that note. On the other side of the break, we'll have the pre opening rates and we'll also have Om Manchanda of Dr. Lal Path Labs to talk about their Q2 numbers. Do stay tuned in.
All right. Uh, well, this is Open Exchange live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal studio. Let's get some FNO action going. Manoj Murli Dharan is joining in. He's the Vice President Derivatives at Religia Broking. Manoj, hi. Good morning. Your thoughts on individual stocks and also on the Nifty. Do you expect more upsides? Uh, good morning, Sonia. Uh, Sonia, I guess uh, for this number series, the rollover that happened on the indices, primarily your Nifty and Bank Nifty, you know, the weighted average price of this entire open interest of almost 1 crore, 1.15 crore that we have on Nifty is closer to 19,400. The gift Nifty is uh, showing a positive opening of maybe an 800 or point. So the market is not going to be easy after the gap of opening. You know, it's going to be a clear tussle between the short rolls that happened into the number series versus the long build up which happened yesterday, if I might say that. So 19,200 and 19,400, this 200 odd point is where the Nifty is going to settle in. And we believe that at least for the next weekly expiry, that is the coming Thursday, we would see a range more or less defined by this. So a sell on rise or maybe buying a put option closer to 19,400 with maybe a 50 points of stop loss should be a better trade for intraday. The same levels for the bank Nifty would be somewhere close to 40,750 to 800. That is the weighted average price of the short holds that we have. Uh, even on the FIR desk, if you see, they are still short by almost 84% into the index future. So uh, uh, buying a put option towards this weighted average price becomes a trade. Stock specific, uh, the couple of stocks, even from the FMCG, we believe that uh, UBL at 1618 to 1620, the stock is in good uh, cash positioning at this level and also a derivative build up. So I believe that the stock is poised for 1660. As a target, the stop loss should be 1600. SBI live from the finance sector also looks good. 1350 is where the stock is trading at. 1328 becomes a good support as a stop loss. And we're expecting closer to 1402 as a target of the stock as well. Got it. All right. Manoj, have a good weekend. Uh, already, you know, all set in your weekend attire. So have a great day. Thanks a lot for joining in on CNBC TV 18. Well, uh, Dr. Lal Patlas is on our radar now. The company's Q2 margins came in at a multi-quarter high aided by price hikes and a better product mix. Their non-COVID revenues have surged while the profits have witnessed a 47% jump year on year. Om Manchanda, who is the managing director of Dr. Lal Path Labs, joins us now. Mr. Manchanda, good morning. You know, their margins have recovered to almost 30% in this quarter and that's a multi-quarter high. Uh, I want to, of course, understand the, the demand trends and the overall business as well, which you very nicely explain to us every time. But first, just some nuances, right? On margins, how much was aided by price hikes this time around? And uh, what is the expectation over the next uh, two quarters, that is in the second half of the fiscal? Uh, good morning. Uh, I think this is a question I've been asking since yesterday. Uh, there are multiple reasons uh, that have led to this uh, margin expansion. Of course, as you rightly mentioned, price increase is one of them. Uh, but I think the most important is also the mix. Uh, during quarter two, as you know, it's a fever season. It's a very high flu season. Uh, usually our mix of test actually swings towards a routine test where gross margin is generally higher. Uh, we've also had... Uh, operating leverage benefit because nearly 600 crore of top line, uh, which is the highest quarter generally in, in any year, uh, that has also led to this, uh, this expansion. So we are very clear this is not a representative number for the year. Obviously, uh, second half of the year, usually our margins are lower. So these margins definitely will taper down as we go along. All right. So the range, uh, doctor, will be around uh, that 24 to 26% that you have been talking about in the past? Not really. I think the, those 24 definitely was at a time when we were uh, facing a lot of headwinds on, on price competition, which is definitely much lower now. I would definitely say that it should revolve around 26-odd uh, uh, percent or so. 26 percent. Okay. All right. What about price increases? You had taken one earlier this year. Any more price increases you managed to push through? Uh, uh, you know, I've been continuously saying that as a for us, the price increase is the last resort as a management team. We definitely uh, want to make sure that our footprint goes wider and deeper, and we want to increase our customer base. As you look at our numbers, I think over the last four quarters, we've been seeing a steady rise in both value and volume. Uh, uh, as a team, we would want to now focus more on volume growth. Uh, let's see what really happens, but I think I want to see a volume growth inching up a little more. Uh, then only we'll think of price increases. Mm. So, uh, could you uh, guide us on volume growth, sir, uh, for this year and the next year? Do you have any numbers in mind? What could we expect? 
So our uh, three to four year CAGR, if I analyze, has been nearly about eight odd percent, and I think we're slightly below that number. I think the first step for me would be to reach that number of eight percent CAGR, and then whatever extra growth that we get, that will be on account of uh, mixed change and first fit contribution and price increase. So I think I definitely would want to inch towards eight nine percent volume growth. And swast fit is about 21% now, sir, of the mix? Yeah, we are seeing some stability in terms of contribution. I think for the last three to four quarters, the contribution has stabilized now around 21-22%. Uh, I think that's a number where probably it will stabilize going forward as well. Okay, that's on Swastfit. Got it. I wanted to understand a little bit about how competition is panning out in the industry. Uh, the last we heard is that, you know, from some of your peers like Thyrocare, etc., is that um, discounting is reduced a bit. Uh, but we also, you, you know, we also understand that uh, places like Farm Easy, Tata One MG have taken price hikes as well. So just give us a sense of where we are in terms of competition. Has it softened compared to what it was last year? And what do you expect as the big trend going ahead? So, so my comment on that essentially is that competition intensity in this business has always been there. It's only that organized competitors have come much more in the last three to four years. Uh, those that number still is there, right? You have competition from hospital space, you have competition from pharma companies. I think that will continue. I think the positive news in the industry today is that it's not a price-led competition. Now, I think the focus is shifted to value-driven competition, uh, which is that people are now focusing on uh, operational excellence, people are focusing on quality, people are focusing on... I think that's a positive news for the industry. To my mind, I think this deep discounting, which was... A, way of life maybe a year, a year from now, I think that's gone away. So to that extent, I think you're right that intensity is much lower. Okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Manjanda, you know, historically you've grown in double digits. Uh, for this year, what kind of revenue growth are you looking at? Since, you know, from a stock market perspective, we have to look at the financials. And also on suburban, there is some concern on the margin front. So throw some light on that as well. Uh, I think if you analyze the entire industry growth itself, the numbers that are in public domain, uh, uh, growth rates for the last two, three years have been a bit softer if you take away the COVID component. Uh, but there are trends where the growth rate is definitely moving upwards. So we are still, industry is yet to come back to the pre-COVID numbers, uh, which used to be in mid teens uh, as far as uh, suburban is concerned, I think we have repeatedly mentioned that our focus is driving top line and we are investing more behind, uh, uh, sort of investing behind growth. So at this stage, a uh, couple of percentage margin up and down uh, is not a cause of concern. In any case, this asset definitely was at a lower margin than, than the parent company. Uh, but for us, suburban asset is really to drive growth in Western markets. That's the way we are looking at it. Okay, just want to understand on the growth aspect, on the revenue growth front, uh, you said that the industry is yet to come back uh, to those growth levels. But for your company, sir, what kind of uh, uh, revenue growth number will you be targeting, give and take everything, the focus on volumes rather than on pricing, and you're looking at it in expanding your reach as well. So what can the revenue growth look like, say for FI24 and FI25? Last time we actually had mentioned that our endeavor is to go for double digit mm. growth, which I think is fairly confident uh, given the way quarter has gone by. We've grown by 12.6% in Q2. And uh, I think on that exit rate, I'm very confident of first, uh, second half also in that similar range. So I think we should just be touching uh, uh, low teens number as, as exit for FI24 is concerned. Mm. <clears throat> okay, and maybe a little better in uh, 25, right? With the uh, yes, uh, 8% volume. It depends then, because, uh, yeah. yeah, it depends because Q2 is, uh, though it's, it's, it's very high, but also there's a season impact. I just want to know, uh, I want to see next couple of months how it goes. Uh, that's why I'm a bit cautious. Well, that's a very important thing uh, you said earlier, which is that competition is there, but it's not based on price cuts anymore. Quality. It's based on, uh, you said quality, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, so I think everybody is focused on now on uh, ultimately quality is the, the mainstay in yeah. this business. And that puts you in a good place, uh, you'd say, or uh, that basically means that, you know, it's it's gotten to a stage where you'll also have to sort of, you know, in a way, uh, reposition your brand and, uh, and and get out there, uh, you know, spend more on uh, sort of advertising, uh, perhaps invest more in the business itself operationally. You think uh, that's the road ahead? Yeah, I think it's at a, at a, at a 
broad level uh, percentage spend on diagnostic as the overall healthcare cost is very, very low. I, I don't think anybody would compromise on the trust, trust part of it. Uh, I think it's, it's the price elasticity on diagnostics, to my mind, is not that really high. Uh, so people will continue to focus on uh, quality and I think they will prefer the brand they trust. Okay. Uh, Mr. Manchanda, I want to understand in terms of m and and acquisitions, right? You have almost 800 crores on your books now. Anything that you have identified, any geographies that you're looking at and anything that you can conclude in the next one year? Uh, there is nothing uh, on the table that I can share uh, with you, but definitely it is part of our stated strategy of widening our footprint through inorganic uh, means. Uh, Suburban was part of that uh, uh, strategy. Uh, I think as of now, if you look at contribution of various regions, South is definitely weaker. Uh, we would prefer to look at something in South of India if possible. So nothing in the next one year? Uh, nothing. You you know these MA things take a lot of time. So. Right now. Okay, doctor. Thanks so much uh, for stopping by and filling us in with those details. Wishing you and your team all the best. We normally talk to you about financials, but you're running a good business out there and all of us are dependent on that as well. So wish you and the team all the best. Thank you. Well, Thank you. time to move on then. I think we can get our 910 call. Our uh, technical experts are back with us. Mitesh uh, joins in. Mitesh, uh, tell us what's your 910 call? Yeah. Najal, I'll go with the... Uh buy on uh, Godrej properties with a stop at 1689 for targets of 1765. Okay, well, uh, you know, the big mover this morning is Tata Motors. And uh, by the way, Mitesh, thanks a lot for that. Have a good day. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly uh, take you through what, uh, why Tata Motors is up 4%. Very good numbers coming through over there. Very strong margins for the J JLR business. JLR margins have actually gone up 430 basis points year on year. And the EBIT margins, right, have come in at 7.3% versus 1% year-on-year. And JLR has actually raised their FY24 EBIT guidance uh, for the full year to 8% from 6% earlier. So they are very confident there. They also continue to expect a free cash flow of over £2 billion in FY24. And they expect the net debt to reduce to less than £1 billion by the end of FY24. Very quickly, Morgan Stanley says it's an impressive quarter. CLSA says the business momentum is very strong. Jeffrey says it's a good quarter too and strong uh, second half outlook. So, uh, you know, that's a big nifty gainer. All right. So now yesterday we had uh, the management of Tata Steel and we do that interview prior to what the analyst calls, you know, before they speak uh, to analysts as well. And we try to get in a comprehensive, uh, you know, analysis with regard to the stock price. And most of it, I think, has come out even in the con call as well. So City, they have gone ahead. They have downgraded the stock to sell. They've cut the target price around 100 from around 140 rupees. The key reasons are there are concerns in domestic pricing, European spreads, and leverage as well. So let's take that point by point. First up, in terms of India pricing. India pricing is at a premium in comparison to Chinese pricing. Why is that? Because India's pricing has been rock solid because demand has been good out here, while Chinese pricing has been faltering. So now you require the Chinese pricing to start moving up for the India pricing to sustain. So that's one factor with regard to India pricing. Next up, Netherlands operations. You know, out there, there has been some pain in the past quarter because of realigning their, uh, their facility over there. And the second factor is that now the contracted price will be lower in quarter three in comparison to quarter two. So for one more quarter, you'll have pain in Netherlands, which then turns around only in quarter four. The situation in Euro in uh, UK as well is far worse. They're still waiting clarity with regard to this entire capex and this rejig that they've spoken about. They've got into a deal with the UK government. But City is a little bit nervous on that front. And finally, the net debt to a bitter at around three and a half times. That's the highest they've seen since F520. So put all this together, City is not impressed. And that's why they've downgraded the stock. Yesterday, though, the stock came off the low point of the day. Okay, well, let's just head to the market opening now. We have about 15 seconds left for the markets to open for the day. And remember, the Nifty is up almost 300 points from the lows that we saw in October 26. So it looks like it's going to be a good start to trade. The global queues have been very strong as well. The Dow is up about 560 points overnight. And you've had very strong numbers from the likes of Tata Motors. By the way, in the broader markets, the stock to look at is JK Lakshmi Cement. It's 6% higher now in trade, in pre-opening, that is, after a good amount of Q2 sales that has come in for the company. And on the downside, something like a Kalpatru uh, projects is down almost about 7 tenths of a percent or so. So lots of individual stocks. You have m and Finance, where the disbursals were quite strong for the company. Disbursal growth coming in at a seven-month high. And then you have a lot of big numbers today. There's the likes of Titan, Escorts, Interglobe Aviation, all of them 
will be reporting numbers today. So there you have it, the first tick on the opening bell, very strong there, 100 point up move. 19,245 is where the Nifty is at. The Sensex is up almost 400 points, looking really good this morning. The Bank Nifty is up about 280 odd points. What's leading from the front is Tata Motors, up about 3%, post a very good set of numbers. Let's not forget that Tata Motors in 2023 has risen 70%. It's been one of the strongest stocks in the auto sector, also a big beneficiary of the um, you know EV adoption. So that stock is up 70%. This year and 3% today. M&M is up about 1% as well, looking good. Hero Motor Corp, so the entire auto space is looking very good. Apart from that, LNT is putting on some more weight, so up about 1% there. Bajaj Finance, Aisha Motors, all in the green at the moment. On the downside, few and far between really. NTPC, Nestle, Tata Steel, ONGC are a few stocks that are in the red at the moment. Uh, but other than that, it's a very, very strong opening, up about 110 odd points. And better yet for the broader market. Well, that's right, Sonia. Tilaknagar Industries, well, that's one of the top volume buzzers today. The stock is up close on 7%. It came out with its set of numbers. JK Lakshmi Cement holding with a gain up front 5%. Good numbers out there. Ratna Money Metals giving you margins of close to around 22%, the highest that we've seen in nearly around nine quarters odd. So that stock as well opens up well in the green, flying away as. Uh, we speak. IFB Industries, I think that stock was a little bit under pressure. So that stock as well should come up for you on the screen. And from the broader markets on the top, FNO gainers, Concord. Well, the stock is flying away. It's up close to around 5% as we speak. So we're off the blocks and we're off the blocks in style on this Friday morning. Okay, well, uh, you know, I think it's a, a pretty good start. Now the task is to build on, uh, you know, what you've got to first sort of got in terms of a start, half a percent higher. It's pretty similar to the kind of start we got yesterday. Uh, at one point, the market did build on pretty handsomely, but then by close, uh, we left off around where we started. Uh, so that's the uh, real uh, sort of thing to watch from here on. Suzlon is up about at about 33, 34 rupees. I mean, just kind of highlighting the top volume-led gains this morning. Uh, so it'll come up on your, yeah, there you go, on your screen. Zomato is up about two and a half, uh, almost 3%, 110, 111. Uh, you know, you got uh, Adani Power, all the Adani Group stocks uh, came out, uh, I mean, rallied yesterday and then came off a little bit towards right at the fag end. Uh, Adani Power is up, up about 3.5%. It's got volumes, by the way. Uh, Container Corporation, Nigel highlighted. Uh, Adan, uh, Tata Motors, of course, we've been kind of uh, talking about uh, as well. Anything else really here, uh, which merits a quick mention? Apollo Hospitals is up about 3%. Stocks up about uh, 3 uh, yeah, at about 5,028. There is JK Lakshmi, which is up about 6%. Tube Investments is up 8%. Tube Investments has got a big move on the, on the back of very large volumes as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a good start, good looking screen overall. Market breadth is some 5 is to 1 uh, in terms of in, in favor of gainers. Uh, you know, Jay Prakash Associates is down 2%. You know, we were highlighting how it's doubled in the last 10 days. Uh, and it's got large volumes this morning as well, just under 18 uh, bucks now. Sirma is down 4%. Sirma numbers disappointed, 503 or so on Sirma. There is Kirloskar uh, Engineering, which is down about what, uh, I think this is Kirloskar Oil Engines, uh, beg your pardon, 8.5% lower, 513. That's a big sharp cut uh, on uh, that name on the back of uh, large volumes. And something like a KDD, El Kamla Dials, has been rallying uh, nonstop. That is pulling back a little bit. It's got a 6% cut at about 23.77 or so, but this is just the start. And things will settle in and there'll be more stuff into the mix as we uh, go, on, go on during the day. We have, uh, you know, the uh, Bank of America team here in the studios with us ahead of their conference, the big conference, which is going to be held in Delhi uh, starting Monday. Uh, and I think uh, this conference is being held after uh, a gap of at least a few years. I think the first since uh, COVID, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let me welcome in Arbin Maheshwari, head of India Equities at uh, Bofa Securities. Uh, Amish Shah is head of India Research at Tebo for Securities as well. Gentlemen, great to have both of you here. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, and uh, at the outset, congratulations uh, for the conference, which is, of course, going to kick, uh, be kicking off. And uh, uh, Nigel, I think, is going to be there uh, in uh, Delhi with Flying all on, of you Flying guys. there on Monday morning, yep. Uh, okay. With all of you guys to talk about the conference and, of course, cover it. Uh, but let's just start with the market and uh, where we are at. Uh, uh, Amish, have you do you see do you feel especially because you have you know a fair bit of globe, global coverage and you get a fair bit of feedback in terms of what's happening there that we've turned in a very significant way after the last FOMC uh, meeting because for the first time uh, you know the commentary etc from uh, the Fed chair seemed very 
very relaxed, very okay with what's happened and okay waiting, inflation can overshoot, etc. But uh, is, it a, the, is the road a little clearer from that perspective, from the global perspective, all the way till the end of the year? What's the sense? So, uh, you know, the road, unfortunately, is not clear. I think there are... At least till the end of the year? No. So, so <laughs> I, I think markets are likely to be volatile if you're a near-term investor. Okay. Uh, you know, till the time there is clarity on global factors. Mm. And there are plenty of them, right? You know, you, uh, one doesn't... Uh, you know, while there was a pause this time, uh, there's a potential that uh, inflation in US can re-accelerate. Mm. Uh, if that happens, you know, you are, again, uh, the, the, the rate hikes are back... Uh, in discussion, uh, you know, the, one doesn't know what's going to happen to the fiscal policy in the U.S. Uh, there is geopolitics going on, you know, connected to that is a crude uh, related issue. You know, so I think in the near term, uh, given that there are global uh, factors where there is volatility, markets will be volatile as well. But if you're a long-term investor, uh, we definitely are bullish. Uh, we think that this is definitely a buy-on buy on dips market. Uh, and and uh, there are several reasons for that. but. Uh, primarily, if you look at the earnings growth in India, they've continued to he hold well, mm -hmm. even including in the second quarter results that we are in. Valuations have now become reasonable. There is 38% of Nifty market cap, which is still trading below long-term averages. You know, so there are plenty of pockets of opportunities to find. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so in general, as far as large caps are concerned, we are bullish. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would stay away from mid and small caps at this point in time. Okay, stay away from mid and small caps. And for the longer term, of course, buy on dips continues. That's a classic playbook that has worked, right, for the Absolutely. last uh, two decades or so. Uh, Arvind, uh, thanks for joining us on the show as well. I wanted to understand from you, how is the tactical positioning right now of India versus other emerging markets and also versus China? Sure, and uh, excited to be here. Thank you. Excited Thank you. about our conference. It's a big event after... Um, after Post-COVID, it's the first conference that we are having, which is physical on the ground. Um, look, I think uh, coming into this year, if we uh, take a step back, there was two years of extremely strong performance from India or outperformance from India versus emerging markets um, and China. Um, and the hope was that there will be some mean reversion trade in there. Um, and that hope led to the first quarter being quite volatile for India. We saw outflows from foreigners up to $5 billion dollars. And in the same period, um, China actually incidentally saw inflows of uh, $25 billion. Um, but that didn't quite last very um, long. I think that mean reversion hope faded away fairly quickly. Um, and then second quarter and third quarter, we bounced back really strongly. There was massive inflows into India, $22 billion uh, from foreigners. Um, and then China started to see outflows, especially September, August and September have been, um, uh, we've seen a chunk of outflows from there. So in terms of um, uh, positioning, I would say India still gets uh, favored over the other emerging market basket. Um, the, uh, you know, emerging markets as a product has seen outflows in the last couple of months. But if you dig a little bit deeper, what is happening is the EEM, which is the ETF tracker for emerging markets, mm -hmm. uh, which includes China, that has seen outflows. But the emerging market ETF, which is ex-China, EMXC, is uh, seeing inflows. So there is definitely um, favorites being played where India, in terms of its positioning relative to other emerging markets, is, uh, is seeing uh, more inflows. And we can see it in the flow. We can see it every day on our pads. I think that's the story we are, um, you know, across Asia, when we look at the overall flow, that's the story that is building up. Well, uh, good to hear that. And morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the studio. Looking forward to catching up with you all at the conference uh, in Delhi on Monday. Uh, Amish, you made a point about earnings, right? Uh, earlier, we were a little bit worried about maybe the street is too optimistic on the earnings outlook from here. Mid-teens, maybe there's a downside risk. But from the earnings that have come up, do you think that there is a possibility that maybe we could see a bit of an upward revision to earnings? And with that sort of a backdrop, what about the banking names? Because earnings are good there, the stocks are not performing. Absolutely. So, uh, so financials look on whichever way you cut it, uh, it would come up as the best risk reward large cap sector at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether you call it positioning, whether there are some concerns that uh, the banking sector earnings have peaked, yeah. uh, you know, because loan growth is going to slow down, there is competition for deposits, NIMS will compress. Uh, you know, all of that said, we think that the sector still has an opportunity to give you at least mid-teens growth. You know, some stocks will probably give high-teens growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that, the sector is really attractively priced. You know, so uh, the part of that is also it getting clubbed with the U.S. financials or global financials. And for them, higher rates is, is an impact on their investment books. 
so maybe Indian banks are getting dragged down along with the global banks. Uh, but uh, definitely a space that we would be very bullish on. And earnings overall has been better than expected? Absolutely, it has been. You know, uh, it, it was better in the first quarter, uh, second quarter again. Uh, you know, one could argue that a uh, large part of the earnings, uh, uh, earnings beats in the second quarter is driven by margin expansion, which may not sustain as we, as we go along. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point in time, uh, Nigel, we are not in the camp of uh, overall nifty earnings getting upgraded. But look at it like this, that we started the year... Uh, expecting 19% earnings growth for Nifty companies for F24. Mm -hmm. We are already already at 16. Uh, our and the consensus is at 16. We are at 15. So I think broadly the Millions. markets have now settled down to where the realistic earnings are. Huh. And then if you if you look ahead in terms of the trends that we've seen for the festive season, uh, all very encouraging uh, so far. So that gives you an outlook of. Uh, the third quarter earnings continuing to support us well. So I'm doing a piece later today uh, on the editor's roundtable looking at earnings. So I'm looking at the nifty, uh, the top 200 companies and what second quarter earnings have done for full year estimates, FI24. And then I, mean, I think we should look at FI25 for now uh, in terms of earnings. But it doesn't feel like it's been a very buoyant earnings season. I mean, that's just the, uh, it's just, okay, it's, it's meeting expectations. There have been a few, <coughs> clearly Reliance, Bajaj, Polycamp, a few others, but... Uh, anyway, we'll uh, look at the numbers as they come in. Arvind, you mentioned uh, EEM ETF X China. Is that a new product or uh, has it been around? It has so been around. So EEM is the one which includes China. EEM <coughs> C is the one which excludes China. So we should now, uh, the category is Asia Pac X Japan X China. Or I, would is that <laughs> I would take it one level higher. I would say now for the first time after many years, we are actually seeing allocators of capital. Um, these are foreign allocators who you know put money. They are looking for India only only mandates, mm. which is standalone India, not including Correct. of Asia, so, including so, of China. As, as, you know, so about 96% of the money that we get, foreign money that we get, comes through these GEM funds, right? Only 4% comes through India dedicated vehicles, etc. Correct. Uh, is that changing in some, we've been waiting for the last one and a half, two years that that will happen. Is, has, is it happening? Is, it the, are that, is that I think the groundwork is being laid for that. So, which is what I mentioned when allocators are looking for India only mandates. Mm -hmm. I think in the, you know, because the story started to play out, especially in the last two years or so, um, the, the India story is really looking like an idea that the time has come for this idea now. So I think it is a long runway and which is what I think makes uh, makes us very bullish, makes investors very bullish that it doesn't seem like a one year, two year story anymore. Mm. People are willing to take a bet and five years, ten years out that this is a story in Asia that is going to emerge as, you know, that the compounder story which always gets associated with India. Mm. The next ten years it looks like a clean runway. It is our battle to lose. And it doesn't feel like it's going to revert anytime soon. Okay, that's a that's yes. a very ambitious uh, statement. The next ten years looks like a clean runway. But I take your point. I mean, there are all the ingredients in place. <coughs> Let's talk about sectors, right? Because that's what matters to our viewers the most. Amish, tell us uh, which is the which are the one or two sectors that you're most bullish on over the next twelve to eighteen months. Uh, has to be domestic cyclicals. We've been uh, bullish on that space for a while. We will continue to be so. Uh, you know, that includes financials, industrials and autos, uh, primarily. Uh, look, uh, you know, uh, very quickly, if you just think about it, uh, most of these sectors have very long cycles. Uh, industrials, for example, you know, either you are in a good cycle for 10 years or you're in a bad cycle for 10 years. We are currently in the third year of a 10-year cycle. So there's a long runway for growth. And what we've also seen is that when the cycle turns, uh, this is a sector where you have a compounding of earnings because your margins double, working capital halves, uh, you know, you, you have your ROE triple, you know, and, and as a result of all of this, your valuation continues to expand. Mm. So are we, uh, you know, I, I know that industrial sector has already given very good returns, but, uh, and then we often keep getting this question that we, are we done? Uh, I definitely don't think so. You know, so I think this is going to be a long runway. Uh, uh, you know, there'll be a series of earnings upgrades and as a result, uh, valuation so will this continue autos to or industrial as a space? Ten, this 10-year cycle that you're talking about? Uh, so, so uh, industrial's for short 10-year cycle. Autos is a, is a sector with ha which has mini cycles. Uh, you know, it doesn't go for that long. Uh, financials, I would say that the wholesale side of the loan growth, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tags along with the uh, industrial cycle. The retail growth is obviously on its own. But you know, in, in, in industrials, right? I mean, if you look at the biggest player there, l &D, for example, it's already been a 50% run in 2023. So one would feel that perhaps the best of the price move is behind them. 
it, that's not a good way to look at it. That's so, not the right way to look so at again, it. Again, I'm not getting to that stock. Sure, sure, but if I look at it on a sector overall, uh, you know, think of it like this, that during the down cycle, these are sectors uh, that probably give you single digit earnings growth. But during the up cycle, these are sectors that will probably give you 20 to 30 percent earnings growth. Mm -hmm. ROEs uh, similarly, you know, during the down cycle is single digit. During the up cycle is in 30s. Uh, right. So as the as the earnings growth and ROE continues to catch up, valuations will also continue to catch up. And therefore, Sonia, yes, I agree that despite the run up, there's a lot of juice in the sector going ahead. Okay, all right, gentlemen, we look forward to meeting uh, you all. I'll be there on, in Delhi on Monday and wishing you all all the best for the conference. Looking forward to get more All insights. the best. You're Thank you. Very welcome. All the best, we look guys. forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, you know, we'll just, uh, I want to highlight just one stock and we'll move on with the next uh, company which we're speaking with, Dr. Lal Path Labs. Five and a half percent higher. Numbers came yesterday. You just heard from the management uh, 10 minutes back uh, and, uh, you know, that headline uh, really rang out. He said, Competition is still there, but the competition is now not based on price cuts. It's uh, it's moved on. It's quality and what you can offer to the consumer, etc. But it's no longer discounting. Uh, in the quarter gone by, uh, we've seen a small price increase. Uh, and he said, well, we'll see about more price increases. But for now, uh, things are looking better. Look at that, 6% higher. Uh, so that is turning out to be the stock of the morning. Uh, as far as earnings reactions go. There's something we call it, you know, the CNBC TV18 impact. impact. <laughs> put it out. Oh, we put like it to out. believe so. <laughs> put, I think you gave the uh, ticket team an idea. We can put it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that's a big move coming in. But let's move on and talk about Berger Pains, right? Because uh, that's a company that has witnessed a mild growth this time in Q2. Gross margins saw, saw sharp expansion, though. The volume growth is also in double digits. Abhijit Roy, the managing director and chief executive officer at Berger Pains, joins us now. Uh, Abhijit, uh, thanks a lot for joining in. You know, the top line growth was about 3.5%, 3.6% to be precise. So I just want to start by asking you, can you tell us what was the volume growth across your product portfolio in this quarter? And can you break it up for us in terms of the product mix as well? And what's the outlook for the second half of the year? So the volume growth, you know, across all sectors put together was about 10.9%. Uh, and uh, if you break it up, primarily it came from the decorative business. Uh, also, the industrials this time, you know, did reasonably well. Uh, and therefore, you know, overall growth rate of volume was about 10.9. Going forward, I think, you know, as far as the volume growth is concerned, uh, we'll probably be around the same points uh, in Q3 uh, and Q4 as well. Uh, but the value growth will go up. Uh, in the second quarter, the value growth was a bit muted because the mix of products which were there were more towards the lower end products. That's the nature of the uh, market of paint, you know, because in Q2, normally uh, the luxury category of emulsions, the premium emulsion sells lesser because of the heavy monsoons which happen at that point of time. So then, you know, in Q3 and Q4, it comes back. So you will see a lesser volume value gap. So value will be much higher in terms of growth rate than what we have seen in Q2. Okay, so you're saying volume growth will be steady around this 10-11% level, but you'll see more value growth rise, uh, rise further in the quarters to come. So would this yeah. mean that you can build on to your margins as well? I mean, this quarter your margins were 17% uh, plus. Is there scope to build on to that because value growth will improve? Yeah, so you know, it might be somewhere similar to that, you know, because the uh, you know the, this rupee uh, has depreciated a little bit. You know, some of the raw material prices have also moved up somewhat, but it will be somewhere around these points only in terms of gross margin and also the EBITDA margin. Right. Uh, hi. Good morning, Mr. Roy. Good to speak to you. Well, in terms of market share, you were telling us that you know you wanted your market share go closer to around the twenty percent, I think, odd mark. Uh, are you yeah. on course? Yes, you know, so uh, that's the good part, you know, that we have crossed the 20% market share mark, you know, in the first half. Uh, mm -hmm. Till result of whatever has been declared, you know, uh, by the top four players, you know, so uh, by that logic, yes, you know, we have crossed the 20% mark. We were at 19.3% uh, last year, end of last year, the India mm -hmm. operations that we have. And, and this year, uh, by the end of the uh, first half, you know, we are at 201 Oh, oh, that's good news then, Mr. Roy. Uh, you know, you had told us maybe if towards the end of this fiscal, but looks like you've achieved it earlier. So good on you. Now you've added some capacity. Yeah. So as a percentage of your total capacity, what is the utilization levels currently? 
so uh, so you know uh, the one plant which we put up uh, sandila is operating at around 48 to 50% now uh, overall the capacity utilization is around 70% to 72% as of now so uh, i think you know uh, as we ramp up you know in terms of volume growth you know as we are seeing uh, possibly the utilization of the sandila plant will also keep going up Mr. Roy, hi, good morning. Uh, you know, the other point where you've been aggressively kind of uh, moving forward is uh, distribution, right? Could you tell us uh, how many more distribution points were added in the quarter and uh, how is that going, that spread out going? So that was, you know, we had a very good quarter in Q2. Uh, we added about 1,700 uh, color bank tinting machines and about 2,000 more retail outlets, you know, total overall, including the 1,700. So. 2,000 retail touch points, you know, which were added and about out of that, 1,700 were color bank tinting machines. So that's a fairly strong number. Uh, and we expect that in the third and the fourth quarter also, we will be able to ramp up, you know, our distribution network, which has been one of our key focus areas. Okay. The, uh, so when you talk about ramp up, can you tell us uh, what is the target over the next one year? So this year we are going to add about 6,500 printing machines overall, you know, uh, okay. and, and about possibly around 8,000 retail touch points. Uh, and and uh, coming year also, we are planning to do a similar number. So uh, it's a strong growth. We have been doing about, you know, 4,000 to 4,500 color bank machines. Uh, this year, you know, we will cross the 6,000 mark for sure. Probably we are attempting 6,500. Once this ramp up happens, just trying to understand uh, any market share, you know, uh, guidance that you have by the end of, say, FY25, where do you hope to be in terms of market share? So we, we expect that, you know, incremental gains will keep happening as we have been seeing for the last two years. We've been growing at about, you know, uh, market share gains have been between 05 to 0.8%. You know, that's what has happened for the last year. And this year also we are seeing a similar trend. So, like that, we would like to go in steps and, you know, keep improving our market share. Sorry, uh, Mr. Roy, just one quick uh, thing, a clar uh, clarification, f maybe for me and for the viewers. You said color, uh, color band printing uh, machine. So, and you said there's 1,700 uh, of those and total touch points is 2,000. What's, what's the difference? Right. So, you know, uh, the, uh, there are some counters which are without printing machines. You know, they are... Mm. You know, for under suppose you know we have opened some distributor and he is selling to uh, smaller retailers who doesn't have machines as of now. These retailers may at a later date take a machine, but as of now he just buys the non-tintable products like enamel, distemper, primer, etc. So 1700 of them are the emulsion category sellers who <laughs> print their products and sell in the market, and there are about 300 more which have been added, taking it up the total to 2000. These 300 do not have printing machines in their counter, but sell other products. Mm. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Roy, you know, good that you have been gaining market share and you're sounding fairly optimistic out there as well. But there's going to be a new large player coming in, Grasim. You know, how do you see the dynamics uh, turn out there? Will you still continue to gain market share? And how are you preparing for this? Ad spends is a percentage of sales. What is it? And are you looking to up that? Yeah, you know, so... Uh... It will be a combination of action. We we believe that, you know, we know the Indian consumer quite well. And uh, we have faced competitions in the past, both, you know, there are existing players which are quite, you know, fierce in competition. And also, you know, there have been uh, international players who had come in earlier and uh, we have fought them in the marketplace. Uh, so it's fine, you know, one competitor more, you know, is going to possibly add uh, some amount of, you know, fun and games in, in as far as the market is concerned. Uh, it will become more interesting, but uh, I don't see, you know, us being unduly worried on this count. Uh, you know, normal, I've been telling this earlier as well, in the decorative business, you know, it's very difficult to uh, penetrate that easily, you know. So, if you see the stories, even in India, you know, uh, you take Lucknow and Kanpur. In Lucknow, we are the leader in Kanpur, Asian is the leader. And this has been there for the last 12-15 years, you know. So, uh, it is not that simple to break into a market, you know, because it has dealers, painters, contractors, interior decorators, consumers, everyone has to be aligned onto your brand. And that takes a long time. So we are not very worried about, you know, what is going to happen, you know, immediately, you know, what, what action will happen. There might be some short-term skirmish, but we are well prepared for that. 
All right. Uh, it's interesting how you describe it. Uh, fu some fun and games. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, point taken, sir. I think, uh, you know, these are entrenched kind of uh, businesses and we've been around for a long time, so not very easy to disrupt. Point taken, Mr. Roy, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Appreciate it as always here on CNBC TV 18. Nigel. Well, uh, all right. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, let's move on. Cholamandalam Investment. Well, the quarter two performance was very, very strong. Loan growth came in at the seven-year high. Assets under management as well has seen a stellar growth, more than 40%. Disbursements are strong, while net interest margins also improve. Mr. Arul Selvan, the president and chief financial officer at the company, joins us on the show. Good morning, Mr. Selvan, and thanks so much for joining in. And congratulations on a good showing. Let's take a couple of Thank aspects uh, first out. Uh, your AUM growth has been fairly good. What kind of a growth momentum are you looking at from year on? And also the new business, well, as a percentage of disbursements, are more than 20%. As a percentage of your AUM, how much will it contribute? What's the target out there? Yeah, I still maintain for the full year a target of uh, targeted AUM growth of uh, anywhere in the range of around 25 to 30 percent. This is primarily coming from the fact that last year, Q3 and Q4 were strong quarters. So even if we clock a good growth in the next two quarters, our growth will sort of uh, moderate to uh, to reflect a 30 percent growth at best. Uh, so we are targeting around that levels for the full year. Uh, so, uh, on the other point on the new businesses, uh, over the next two to three years, we expect the new business share to be around 20% of the overall AUM. Uh, mm -hmm. We will uh, have uh, vehicle finance in the range of around 50% plus. Uh, it will moderate from the current 60% to around 50%. The LAP and uh, the home loans will uh, take their balance, uh, which will be the another 30%. Okay, Mr. Selvan, you know, on the new business, there are some concerns with regard to the asset quality. Uh, you know, so could you give us some more clarity out there? How is the asset quality shaping up in the new business? And how is the yields different from your existing business? So we have three new businesses, the SME segment, then the CSL segment, which is the unsecured segment, and we have the SBPL, which is a mortgage to, a, to, to the lower end of the strata of, of self-employed non-professionals. Mm -hmm. In the case of SME, the yields are very fine because we are targeting, you know, somewhere at the top of the pyramid type of SME customers, one one notch lower where the banks are there, we are, we are there in that segment where yields are very fine. But credit tested customers and we, we feel that the returns on the at a NIM level would be lower. But at an overall level, we still will clock a reasonable return to, you know, sort of fail our profit growth. The CSL business is a, is an unsecured business where we are trying uh, two different formats right, right now, which is uh, some part through the fintechs and some part to, through our own traditional model where our, we have our own people going and meeting the customer and, you know, canvassing business. In right. both the cases, the yields are fairly high and, sorry. Uh, and, go ahead, uh, please go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yields are fairly high and uh, we are seeing good uh, traction there. Um, we are watching the uh, credit cost and the uh, delinquencies. The delinquencies, while it had moved up compared to what we had done over the last few quarters, it is still much lower than uh, I know overall industry averages. And we are confident that we will continue to be below industry averages. I think we have even sounded out that initial years, the delinquencies will be lower and we, we expect it slightly going up in the future. The so, SBPL right now is a very small volume. And and, uh, and there the yields are high. Sorry, I was just covering the three parts. My apologies. Yeah. No, Please no, no, absolutely. It. Sorry, the second yeah. part, the unsecured, what do you call it, sir, Mr. Selvan? The, we call the it a <coughs> consumer and small enterprise loan. Consumer because right. here so that again, is where the, the target segment is the business segment. Yeah, it's but not the, like the, that is where any other these increases in a uh, uh, little bit of uh, asset quality issue is coming, right? That right. particular Correct. segment. Uh, yeah. So what is a comfortable level here in new businesses? Uh, you know, what, what would what would you be willing to <clears throat> sort of suffer in that sense? Uh, go up the, to at a 90 APD level, it should be you know slightly in the range of around two to 2.5 percent would be what would be comfortable. So you're at about what uh, right now? One and a half percent. Yeah, we are at around one and a half percent. Yeah. So you're saying you'll be it may go up. willing to go up to about two and a half percent. 
Correct, correct. But we are, we are providing at a much higher level there. So if you look at the provision coverage there, it will be in the range of around 70%. So uh, we, are, we are comfortable doing it at that level. And you are saying that uh, these new businesses should be uh, should should go up to you said thirty percent over a period of time. Twenty percent. Twenty percent. Sorry, fifty percent is vehicle finance, thirty uh, is uh, yeah. uh, lap and housing, and uh, the remaining twenty is this. Okay. okay. Uh, what does all of this mean for your overall net interest margins, uh, Mr. Selvan? Uh, so you know, on a quarter on quarter basis, your margins have improved, but uh, how do you see it pan out, and have the cost of funds bottomed out? Yeah, uh, we are fairly confident that uh, from here on we should have uh, better cost of funds uh, and uh, unless uh, something changes in the overall market environment or you know, at a global level as well as at the domestic level. Uh, so we should see some improvements on the cost of funds side. And yields mm -hmm. will also improve because uh, progressively the fixed rate book, which is the vehicle finance book, we are repricing and we will see some yield improvements. Though it would be of, uh, you know, it will be a very slow progress because it will take another two to three quarters before you will see a visible change. If there's small changes you are, would have already noticed that we have reported. Hmm. Uh, I also want to ask you about the, uh, you know, if you have any plans to raise funds, uh, what would the amount of funds be that you're, you know, that you need at the moment and what are we looking at in terms of a timeline? If you are talking equity, we have already raised the funds, though it came in in the first week of October. Uh, we have raised 4,000 crores, by, 2,000 crores by way of equity and 2,000 crores by way of uh, compulsory convertible debentures, which will get converted over the next two to three years. So from an equity side, we are fairly comfortable uh, from a capital adequacy or a debt equity you know, uh, leveraging uh, con context. Uh, if you are asking about the debt, yes, we constantly Currently, raise debt. Uh, our appetite would be to raise around uh, anywhere between 5,000 to 7,000 crores every month. Uh, so we will continue to do that. We have multiple sources, banks, uh, markets, money markets. Uh, we have also tried uh, public uh, yeah. debt. We have done uh, some public debt out there. Uh, so we, have, we will continue to do raise debt side uh, through these uh, sources. All right. Right. Uh, uh, Mr. Selvan, uh, you know, the last time you joined us, you told us the cost of borrowing is likely to have bottomed out and NIMS will improve, which did happen. So good on that. But could you give us a number? What's the outlook on NIMS from year on, point number one? And point number two, the cost to income ratio, it went a little bit higher because of a couple of uh, expenses that played out in the last quarter. Where does that number stabilize at? Uh, Nim, I, I will not right now want to commit a number, uh, but as, as I said, directionally it will improve because both cost of funds would come down and yields will in, increase. But as I said, it will be progressive for the, in the okay. sense uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty about the prevailing cost of funds in the market. It's been very volatile. We, we will have to watch for another one or two quarters before we get a firm grip on whether it's directionally southward bound. Uh, with regard to your next question cost to income. on um, cost, to uh, income. Co cost to income, yeah, the OPEX. Uh, yes, OPEX has gone up. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a little bit of a shift between line items because what we traditionally used to keep it as an outsourced cost within our own uh, system, uh, we, we used to have the feed on state outsourced to, through an, another company of us. We brought all the employees or most of the employees onto our Chola payroll itself. So you will see the employee cost going up, but the uh, other costs coming down. Overall, there would be, uh, you know, more or less in line with the AEM growth, the, the cost to income, uh, the cost to asset ratios has moved up. Uh, yes, uh, we, we do have a slightly higher cost to income uh, ratio. This is primarily because we focus on having separate teams for each vertical and even within each vertical we have separate uh, sales credit and collection teams and this do add to the cost to uh, cost but it gives us better underwriting better uh, yield uh, and better uh, collection efficiency so we continue to follow that uh, you know process of uh, having slightly higher manpower uh, but mm -hmm. overall target is to keep it within the 3% to average assets uh, limit to give you the answer on that. 
Okay, Mr. Selvan, we'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in. That's Chola Mandalam Investments. Strong disbursement growth is what they've seen. And that was the outlook on their business. Let's take a quick break. The markets are looking quite good, actually. 100 points higher on the Nifty now. It's been steady through the course of the morning. Amit Uplenchwar of Kalpatru Projects will be joining in for Q2 earnings. Later, Sanjay Purohit of Sapphire Foods will be joining in for their Q2 performance as well. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so you got the market, which is up a hundred uh, points, so cruising along uh, comfortably at uh, this point in time. We're just under. Actually, we're not just under. We're uh, pretty much at the uh, where we. Uh, okay, we're we've lost a little bit. Yes, from the day's highest point, we've lost a little bit. The high was made at uh, 9:32. Uh, 20 minutes out, we're down a little bit uh, from that uh, level. Now, Sapphire Foods is the next company we are speaking with. Uh, for the second quarter, the company saw double-digit revenue and a bit of growth. But this growth, uh, the rate of growth is slower than what we've seen in the first quarter. Their profit is also impacted by lower tax, expense, tax expenses, uh, which was in the base. Sanjay Purohit is whole-time director uh, and a group chief executive officer of the company. He's joining us right now uh, to take some questions. Uh, Sanjay, good morning. Great to have you with us here, as always. Appreciate your time. Uh, you know, we were just discussing <clears throat> how this is this is the time for, you know, your, your kind of businesses. So, uh, you know, but let's just, uh, uh, we'll get we'll get to how you're doing now and what are you seeing out there. But I want to start with what's ailing pizza sales. You know, Pizza Hut, uh, same-store sales growth, uh, languishing, margins looking very tough. Is it a, is it a phase, really? Uh, I think I asked you the last time around as well, is it affordability, which is an issue? Because burgers are doing just fine. Go on. So uh, on the balance, out of the three businesses that we run, two are doing really, one is doing really well, one is starting to come back. And Pizza Hut, we have seen an issue, perhaps the last four quarters has been tough. So three points, one is undoubtedly the QSR market, there is a little impact of consumer demand headwinds. And you can see that in the results of virtually everyone else. So that's one. Number two, this category has seen a little greater amount of competitive intensity, especially with a couple of players opening stores left, right and center. So there's been a little bit of um, unadulterated expansion. So that is two. Third is perhaps, and I don't to give this as an excuse, that we are comping a very high SSSG last year. So we grew at 23% uh, last year. And therefore, if you look at it from a two-year perspective, we are about one and a half to two percent, which is actually in line with many of the other pizza players. So we think it is a temporary phase, even the expansion that has happened in the market with other players. All of this will uh, sort of come to roost in the next uh, 12, 18 months. We continue to focus on four things. One is how do we build brand salience? How do we diet, uh, deliver a strong dine-in experience, build home service? And then we are going to recalibrate our restaurant expansion. Okay. Uh, Sanjay, hi. Good morning. Uh, you know, you've been through this several times in the past, but it is quite a lethal combination, right? On one hand, strong competition, and on the other hand, a slowdown in overall consumption. Uh, can you tell us what does this do to your top line? Because so far, at least until this quarter, you've managed to do double-digit growth, about 15% growth on the top line. Do you reckon that in this journey of next 12 to eight month, 18 months, before things improve completely, you may even get to, you know, single-digit growth or... Uh, low teens in terms of growth? I mean, is that something that you are forecasting? So, uh, when you look at the KFC performance, Sonia, that perhaps gives you an idea of how this could play out. KFC strong brand, undoubtedly leader in its category. We have seen flat SSSG, but on the back of expansion, we have seen 19% growth. In the first half, 20% growth. And 20% growth... We've also had a restaurant EBITDA margin at 20%, which is our highest ever. So if you're able to manage the overall restaurant profitability, then we will continue to expand. 
And while internally we want to deliver a 5 to 7% uh, same store sales growth, uh, and therefore coming at flat SSG disappoints us, when you look at it in the perspective of the entire industry, I think KFC has been just absolutely fantastic. Mm. Hi, Sanjay. Uh, good morning. You know, I don't know what people are talking about. Slow down. I'm consuming left, right and centre. <laughs> but uh, uh, tell us about, uh, you know, a few more aspects about business. The KFC margin, as you said, you were looking at 20%. You've achieved that. Uh, you know, once SSSG starts becoming positive, then what's the outlook out here on the margin front? Yeah. So, um, as again, say, possibly competition, you've heard us say this, that we want to expand and improve accessibility. So if you look at the other, perhaps burger brand, their uh, expansion is much, much lower than us. And our expansion is uh, significantly higher. So I think uh, restaurant EBITDA margins around 20% is what we are happy with. We'll calibrate our expansion. Therefore, if we are able, if we see operating leverage, expand a little faster. If we see operating deleverage, expand a little slower. This kind of pace of expansion, but should continue over the next uh, three to four years. All right. You know, Sanjay, in the last 12 to uh, 20 hours, a lot of us are focusing on Sri Lanka. That was the match. You know, and we were happy to come out on top. But I recall one of the reasons that your business was not getting that sort of a multiple was because of the exposure to Sri Lanka. You were telling Correct. us in the past, you know, it's now coming out of ICU in the hospital bed. You know, things are improving out there. So green shoots out there. Will things continue to improve from year on? Yes. So that's the advantage, uh, Nigel, of a multi-brand restaurant operator platform. Um, and there are times when everything fires... But even if everything doesn't fire, at least two out of the things starting to fire is always good. So Sri Lanka, we had called out saying that in calendar year 24 is when we would see recovery of the economy and therefore our business. I think the economy started to recover right now. Raw material inflation, absolutely stable. In fact, in single, low single digits. But there, are in, there is inflation in other uh, parts of the business, for example, utility costs, etc. Um, uh, there's no problem on Forex. Forex has been stable. Actually, the Sri Lankan rupee has appreciated versus the dollar. So from a macro sense, really good. Tourism is absolutely starting to take off in the country. Mm. Um, so, And our business also has started to do well. We launched a really innovative product what mm. I call inverted pizza called melts, individual consumption. So things looking good in Sri Lanka. Okay. I All think right. take calendar year 24 for it to fully come back. Yeah, Sanjay, one, actually, if you can, in two, word, two, two words exactly, if you can give us, we're out of time. You said we're recalibrating our expansion plan. So are you cutting down how many stores you will open from what you said earlier? And if so, what is the number? Yes, mm. we will... Uh, slow down, but we should, um, we we called out three to four years doubling, perhaps today on Pizza Hut, it will be four years and not three years. Okay, okay. from three to, uh, doubling in four, maybe not uh, three, that's what you're saying. Uh, thank you very uh, much. Wait, I, I have a very important question. Yeah. What is this inverted pizza? I, I am very keen to know. <laughs> the, is it cheese on the bottom and the sauce on the top? How does it work? <laughs> so, Sonia, we've got to go to uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, and try the product <laughs> out. It's absolutely sensational. By the way, so the guys, you know, folded, uh, the dough is folded, and you've got all your fillings inside. Brilliant product. Oh, like a pizza sandwich. Like oh, wow. Wrap, huh? <laughs> but uh, you know, guys, we're uh, we not even the the biggest talking point globally for restaurant chain, Sanjay, and we're not talking about it here because it's not here. Is this new weight loss drug? There are actual estimates saying that, well, because it kills hunger, mm. uh, how many calories are going to go down and how people are going to consume less? I mean, it's the, it's the biggest talking point, not just for food companies, restaurant companies, but for beverage companies, etc. as well. So, uh, But companies here, Indian companies have applied to get permission, etc. to get it here. Are you suggesting we have <laughs> pizza and then we <laughs> pop an Ozempic? <laughs> okay, you know, we've completely run out of time, but we would love to take this another day. Thanks a lot, uh, Sanjay, for joining in. Really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you, Thank you Nigel. Thank you, Prashant. Happy Diwali to all of you, to all your viewers.
We're keeping the consumption strong, I promise you that. <laughs> happy Diwali, happy Diwali to you. All right, uh, let's move on. Kalpatru Projects is on our radar now. For Q2, the company's margins were impacted by the execution of the lower margin projects. Also, higher interest costs has impacted the bottom line. Amit Uplenchwar, who's the director at Kalpatru Projects, joins us now to talk about that. Uh, Amit, thanks a lot for joining in. You know, this margin contraction is something that perhaps is concerning the street as well. Uh, can you tell us, you're sitting on a very big order book right now, almost, uh, you know, 47,000 crores. As you execute that order book, will it come at the cost of lower margins? And what is the outlook for the second half of the year? Hi, uh, good morning. First, uh, very happy Diwali, upcoming Diwali to you and all your viewers. Uh, you. So, from a, to answer your question, from a margin perspective, uh, you know, this is still H1. We have always guided that we shall be in the range of 4.5% to 5% at a PBT level at uh, the end of the year. And I think we've had a mix of projects. Some started, you know, later than planned. Some did not happen. And we've also had one project which we had planned in Australia, which we've exited now. So we've taken that project out of our L1 list as well. And that gave uh, a little bit of a hit on our margin. But overall, if you see, we had guided at around four and a half, five percent And I think we will end the year at four and a half, five percent at PBT levels for full year. All right. Hi, Amit. Uh, good morning and good to see you in. You know, earlier you were guiding for revenue growth of around 30%, uh, you know, in comparison to FI23 numbers. You're on course for that? So, you know, we are slightly revising that to 25% plus okay. because... Like I said, we had some projects that started late because of, uh, you know, reasons that were out of our control. And our Australia project, which we thought would contribute, you know, to our revenues uh, by way of supplies, etc. also. But having said that, uh, overall, 25% plus still for the end of the year is something that we are pretty confident we'll achieve unless something really goes off track. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to the business in a bit, but lest we run out of time, I just wanted to check with you. You know, a certain portion of your promoter holding, is it still pledged? If you can tell us how much is the promoter holding that's pledged at the moment? And is there a chance of more promoter blocks that could come into the market? So, you know, we had uh, said that we would not increase, uh, at, you know, as promoter holding any longer going forward beyond the levels that they already are. And I think if you see the trend, I think uh, we are at 44-odd percent of promoter holding, which was well above 50% last year. So in that sense, the trend is uh, to keep reducing the promoter pledge, and it's uh, at, at comfortable levels. And we will only try and keep those uh, levels going down rather than going up from this point on. You have a targeted number? So we don't have a targeted number, but for sure I can tell you that we do not wish to increase them going forward. Okay, all right. Well, you know, there were some uh, IT raids as well. And these sort of things, you know, they make shareholders uncomfortable. Is there an update out there? Have they asked for some information? You'll have furnished that. What's the update? Because, you know, that'll soothe the nerves of shareholders as well, based on your reply. So, IT, uh, you know, we are uh, cooperating with the uh, agencies and providing them information as they've been asking. And I think in routine course of business, we will continue to do so. And if there is anything that has any impact uh, at all on uh, numbers, mm -hmm. etc. We will come back to you within the uh, guidelines as soon as that happens, but I don't see that happening at the moment. Okay, all right. You had a couple of projects, I think, that you were looking at divesting, right? Maybe uh, make, bringing the balance sheet in better shape. Uh, could you tell us what is the balance sheet looking like and are there any assets that you're looking to offload? So, you know, looking at balance sheet, I think our balance sheet is the strongest that it has ever been. We are mm -hmm. still at 104 days of uh, working capital cycle for an infra company. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, pretty amazing. We are trying to bring it down to less than 100 days by the end of the year. Uh, so far as our non-core uh, road asset, which we were uh, having a non-binding offer, uh, you know that we've not sort of gone ahead with that for the moment. We are still talking to several other uh, parties. But on a heartening note, I think we've had for the last five quarters a 15% CAGR on our total revenues. Uh, this quarter as well, we've hit an average daily collection of over 58 lakhs per day, which has for the first time made our projects a bit positive. And hence, there's no drain on the company any longer in terms of us funding these SPDs uh, other than the, uh, you know, the debt servicing. 
but we are definitely looking at an appropriate time and a good offer which is in the interest of all shareholders uh, to exit it still remains a non core as we have defined earlier and we will be focused on trying to uh, you know get it off our balance sheet sooner than later all right okay thanks a lot for joining in uh, and you know speaking to cnbc tv 18 let's take a quick break on that note on the other side we'll put the focus on the commodity markets with manisha gupta stay tuned for that Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. It's not bad actually for the market. We have Manisha Gupta is joining in to tell us if it's equally good in the commodity markets or not. Uh, Manisha, good morning. Morning and thank you for that, Sonia. Well, I'm looking at the metal prices, and this week actually has been quite positive for across metals. But within the space as well, if there is one thing that has outperformed the sector, that clearly has to be steel. If you look at the rebar futures, we've seen constant growth come in for this one. It is trading at a multi-week highs as well. It's trading at a six-week highs right now. And for the week, we've seen prices gain up by four percent. And if you look at the last one month, we are up by nearly six percent for the rebar prices here. The demand outlook has been on the stronger side, and the markets are looking at supply. Concerns continuing into the street. There, when you look at the inventories, they have been declining. Uh, pan country, Plan Global, and especially in China as well. And then for especially China, there are worries about winter output curbs as well to ensure that there isn't enough so much pollution. And that is the sentiment that seems to be keeping the prices on the higher side. There also have been reports from Rio Tinto and J.P. Morgan saying that the high infra spend from China will support the prices for the near term, but for the longer term, you need to see a sustained demand continuing from China. 
China and various other parts of the consuming world as well. A very interesting report really from the World Steel Association which says that this year and the next as well, we are looking at higher demand growth to continue. But within that pocket as well, India is expected to outperform in a very strong way. For 2023, the World Steel Association feels that the world demand uh, will see an increase by nearly 1.8%. But within that, India will see an increase of 8.6%. This is for this year. So we clearly are looking at the world averages uh, being outperformed by India. Next year as well, even as we are looking at further growth in the world markets, India's growth will continue to outperform in that sense as well. So 7.7% is the estimate for the steel demand growth going forward in the next year as well. Okay, thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our special segment, it's the economy. Lata will get chatting with Jahangir Aziz of JP Morgan to review the Fed's decision interest rates as it decides to hold the rates steady again. Stay tuned.